morning. Sometimes I wonder what, what would Paul do if we just didn't come up here? Like if Pastor Mark didn't come up, he would just keep playing until somebody just comes up, you know? We'd have to just call in somebody to come up. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, he'd rather do that than preach. We appreciate you, Paul, uh, and what you and your, uh, your team does for our ministry, so thank you. Well, welcome and good morning. We're glad that you're here today. Uh, glad you've joined us for worship and to be here together as a body of Christ, and just want to welcome you here this morning. So far, uh, in 2016, uh, we've been talking about Jesus. Amen. That's, what else do you need to talk about? And sometimes we joke about how, you know, in church, the right answer is always Jesus, but that's a good thing, and because Jesus is the answer. And the more we talk about Jesus, the more we want to be like Jesus, the more we'll be like Jesus, the more Jesus will be in this congregation in this community, the better. And that's the way I see it. And so I'm so thankful that that's kind of our, our theme and our thought so far this year. Pastor Mark has been talking about many things within that, but mostly we've uh, been exploring what it means to be crucified and how Jesus was crucified. And so we've looked at a couple of different verses. I want to start this morning by just right away, just opening right up into God's word. So if you want to join me, you can open up your Bible uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 5. Uh, the, the scriptures will also be up on the screen, and we're going to um, look at a couple of the verses right now just to kind of get started and um, remind and review a little bit of what we've talked about so far this year, and then we're going to get into uh, some stories of Jesus. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 through 5. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I'm thankful for this verse for many reasons. First of all, Paul's basically saying it doesn't matter what he, that it's him that's speaking because he's inadequate, but it's the power of God that's working in him. And so I'm thankful for that because that means people like me can get up here and speak and we know that it's the power of God speaking through us and then it's not really us. So praise the Lord that it's not me, it's God who speaks to us today. I'm also thankful for it because it tells us that Paul said he would know nothing except for Christ crucified and he wanted to live that out and so he wanted to live more of Jesus and less of me and then later Paul writes to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 and he says I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me and so the last couple of weeks, Pastor Mark has been exploring this, and we've had some challenges, and I just want to ask, how many of you in here have accepted those challenges and attempted to uh, memorize? The last two weeks, we memorized the first half and then the second half of this verse. Anybody? Okay, a few, a few hands slowly went up. It's okay if you didn't, but what I want to do is just as Pastor Mark is done, I want to read through this together. And if you haven't done this yet, there's a great verse to meditate on, to memorize, and maybe you're not about scripture memorization, but it is a really good thing for us to do, to just be meditating on God's word. And so I'd encourage you this, this next week even to just continue to meditate on this. So let's read this together as we kind of get started this morning. Galatians 2 verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. It's a great verse. Paul talking about how Christ was crucified and we have been crucified. And, and if you weren't here for those messages, Pastor Mark talked about that in the last couple of weeks and, and just showed us many different ways how many things in our life become crucified when we fully give out our whole life to Christ. It's no longer I. It's no longer me. It's always Christ. More Jesus less of me. More Jesus, less me. And when Pastor Mark gave the first sermon of the year, uh, he, he just kind of just talked about that. Just more Jesus. That's what we want here at Bayside. More Jesus, less of me. 
more Jesus, less of us. And so today I just want to talk about what it looks like when we are more like Jesus. What it looks like in our community when we are more like Jesus. Here at Bayside, in our lives, how can we be more like Jesus? You know, they say that, that faith is believing in something that you cannot see. And there's so many people in this world that struggle with faith and that don't believe in God or what we believe in because they can't see God. Have you ever met somebody who's told you that? How can you believe in something that you cannot see? It's faith, right? That's the definition. That's one of the definitions of faith. What I say in reply to that whenever I'm in a conversation with someone is that I can see God. Now, I can't physically see God or Jesus Christ, and that's probably the hard part for a lot of people. But I see God every day working. And I see Jesus almost every time I'm here on a Sunday or a Wednesday. I see him. I see the hands and feet of Jesus. And in my time here at Bayside in the last 10 years, I have seen Jesus over and over and over again in you. In our congregation, in this community. You being the hands and the feet of Jesus. And so today, this is what I want to explore. How can we be more like Jesus? In the last few weeks, God has impressed upon my heart just many areas here at Bayside where I've seen Jesus. And as I studied the scriptures this last week and looked for different examples of what Jesus did and how we can live like him, I just came across three different ways where we can be like Jesus, where I've seen people in our congregation being Jesus. And I want you to know right now, before we get into this this morning, that there are so many of you who are being Jesus. And there's so many examples, countless examples, of, of where we see Jesus in the hands and the feet of the people of Bayside Baptist Church in a multitude of ways, on Sunday mornings, on Wednesday nights, and throughout the week, every single day. Here at this building, you'd be amazed if you spent enough time here and you were here to see, it's just amazing the people coming in and out of this building that are acting and being the feet and the hands of Jesus. And so please know that when I just use just a couple of examples today, that I'm not saying these are the only people, and I'm not saying that what you have done isn't as good. I'm just highlighting three that I was impressed upon this last week as I prayed about this and as I studied this. And so please know that and know the intentions of my heart as we look to Jesus and what he did and as I share just a few examples from our congregation of people that are being more like Jesus. So let's start this morning in the book of Matthew. You can open up with me to Matthew chapter 15. It's a story of Jesus that probably most of us have read. Matthew 15 verses 29 through 32. Before I, before I read that story, just again, another thought is that all of the Gospels and the Bible are filled with examples, and it would take uh, many, many sermons to be able to share all the things we could do like Jesus did. So again, we're just picking three of those things today. Matthew 15, 29 through 32. Jesus went on from there and walked beside the Sea of Galilee, and he went up on the mountain and sat down there. And great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet, and he healed them, so that the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing. And they glorified the God of Israel. Then Jesus called the disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I'm unwilling to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. Now you might be thinking to yourself, Tom, we can't heal people. And Tom, if you didn't know, that the next thing he does is he feeds 4,000 people with very little amount of food. And you might be thinking, well, I can't do that. I'm not a miracle worker. And yes, we believe in miracles of God working through us, but to feed 4,000 people, no one's ever done that at Bayside. Uh, and to heal these many different examples that Jesus did, no one's ever done that. But I want to look deeper into this verse. Verse 32, Jesus called the disciples to him and said, 
I have compassion on the crowd. I have compassion on this crowd. You see, Jesus had compassion for the needs of other people. All, everywhere he went, every step that he took, people followed him and were always asking. Once he became known and the more popular he became, people continued to show up and to follow him and to come and to ask him for help to heal them or their friend or their brother or their relative. And so people are always pulling on Jesus. And in that and through that in his entire ministry, he always looked to fill the needs of the people because he had compassion on them. And in this story with these 4,000 people that he eventually fed, he had compassion on the people. He saw a direct need that the people had. There were 4,000 people and they were hungry. They needed food. And so he took action. He saw a need. He knew he could fill that need and so he took action. And I see that this same thing has happened here at Bayside. And I just want to highlight uh, some friends of mine. Ray and Cindy are an, an older couple at our church who have been around for a long time. Ray has been a part of this church his entire life. And, and they have been dedicated to Bayside and, and this church for many, many years. And just recently, I just came across something that happened with them. They, they were here at Bayside, I believe, kind of over the summer and the fall, and, and they were sitting in their spot that they were sitting in, and they noticed a couple in front of them, a newer couple to the church, a younger couple. And they just noticed them, and then the next week, they saw them kind of sitting there and noticed that there weren't a lot of people talking to this new couple. And, and that's okay, that happens a lot. There's four or five hundred of us coming in and out every Sunday, meeting and greeting everyone, and sometimes that'll happen, and we apologize if that's ever happened to you. Our intent is that everyone would feel welcomed and apart. Not that they didn't feel welcomed and apart, but Ray and Cindy realized that this young couple hadn't been really connected into the church yet. And so they asked them if they would be willing to go out for lunch, and so they took this couple out for lunch. They saw the need that this couple didn't have anyone that they had connected with yet. And so Ray and Cindy said, hey, we'll take you out to lunch. And, but they, they continued to go beyond that. They could have just stopped there and said, we did our part and we said hi and all that stuff and even bought them lunch. Uh, but then after that, then they intentionally tried to introduce this couple to other young couples. And so they, they introduced them to me and my wife and to a few other couples and, and intentionally, intentionally helped this couple to get to know other couples. And then if that wasn't good enough, they did that, they took them out to eat, and then they introduced another, now they, Ray and Cindy could just say, okay, we've done our part, now they can just hang out with the young couples and have a good old time and be a part of Bayside. No, they went beyond that. They coordinated and contacted multiple couples and said, hey, let's all go together. And they, uh, we all met and went to the Christmas City of the North Parade and just had this time of fellowship together and afterwards bought us all pizza and had a wonderful time together. And intentionally, Ray and Cindy saw the need of this young couple in our church who was newer, who they could tell were, were needing some connection. And they intentionally and purposefully went above and beyond the call of the fellowship here at Bayside and welcomed this couple in and tried their best to get this couple to be a part of things. And now this couple is a part of a small group and, and really interacting and a part of this church and feeling like this is where they're supposed to be and where they want to be and where they can serve. And to me, Ray and Cindy were being Jesus. They were being Jesus. You see, they saw a need. And they had compassion. And unfortunately, it saddens me to think this. How many other people have walked through those doors and sat down in this sanctuary and didn't get welcomed and didn't get connected and walked out those doors and felt like, man, I'll try somewhere else next Sunday. And I don't know because we don't keep a track at the door and we don't have cameras and, and all that, although it would be nice sometimes to be able to keep track of everyone who comes here. Um, we don't do that, and so we don't know. We can't quantify that. And I believe that Bayside is a very welcoming uh, community, I really do. Um, but I just think about it and it saddens me to think how many people have come here and not felt welcomed. And I hope that's not you. I hope today that you feel like you're a part of this congregation and that somebody will greet you today and welcome you and that you'll be able to connect. But what each one of us can do in the same way that Ray and Cindy did is to look and to see and have compassion on people 
within our congregation. It may not be that somebody needs to be connected. It may be somebody needs prayer or they need a hug or a handshake or they need something specific. And when we see those needs, we can step up and be Jesus. And not only see those needs, but act on that and to live that out. And Ray and Cindy saw those needs. They took action to meet those needs, intentionally being Jesus to someone else. Thank you, Ray, and thank you, Cindy. Next, I want to look at Matthew chapter 8. If you want to move to Matthew chapter 8, a few chapters back, verses 1 through 3. Talking about Jesus again. When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately, his leprosy was cleansed. Again, another person coming to Jesus, pulling on him, just like we talked about. Many people coming to him and and having specific needs and, and this man comes to him and says, Lord, if you're willing, I know you can do this. He had faith. And Jesus said, I'm willing. I'm willing. He was willing to serve for the benefit of others. Look just a few verses later, if we go down to verse 5. Again, it happens. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him. And he said, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The rest of the story is the the, the man said, you don't even need to come. You could heal him right now. And Jesus said, okay, he's healed. Amazing that he was willing to do this, that he had the power to do it. Now, we may not have the power to heal people, but are we willing? Are we willing to serve and to give for the needs of others. Jesus was willing. The man said, God, if you're willing, you can do this. And he said, I am willing. I see this happen all the time at Bayside, and there's many people who could fall into this category. But I want to highlight my friend Rick Peterson. Rick is willing, always willing, to do anything, to give anything, to help not only the body of Christ, not only this church and the building here, but anyone who needs help. I don't know if you remember, but a couple years back, I preached a sermon about the broken in our community and how I came across this guy who was from our community that was homeless. And God just put it on my heart to try and help him. And there's this long story of how I helped him. And, and I told and I preached that story. And, and the man had told me there was somebody else who had helped him in the community. And, and after that first service, I gave that sermon Rick Peterson came up to me and said, I'm pretty sure that's the same guy that I helped at Walmart. And I brought him and I gave him some dinner because he hadn't eaten anything in two days. And we talked and we found out it was the same guy. And that's just one example. Rick has helped in so many different ways around this building with many different projects and ministries and was willing to go on missions trips. Or when we have a specific need, is willing to give towards that need. And so I just appreciate that there's people like Rick and there's so many more than just Rick that are willing to to serve and to give, not for their own benefit, because many times it's people like Rick that do it without any recognition. And if that's you, you know who you are and we thank you because there's so many people. It's like the awards shows. I could stand here and thank hundreds of people, right? At the awards shows when they get up there and like, I want to thank this person and this person and this and they run out of time, the music starts. We could do that here today. We could do that with all the people we could thank that are so willing to give and to serve. But just like Jesus was willing, Rick has been willing, and so many of you in this congregation are willing to serve and to give for this, for this body of Christ, for this church, for our community, and beyond. So thank you, Rick, for being willing. I want to move now to Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 through 15. Then Jesus were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. 
For, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. Jesus, more than once, showed his care and compassion and his love for children. We've preached on this before. And you've probably heard it from me time and time again how important our young people are. I am the youth pastor. And so I do care so much about the young people. And I also have three younger than that are in the youth group, but I have three little ones that you'll see racing around here. Okay, so I do care about the children because I'm a dad and I'm a youth pastor. But go back and you can see last spring, both Pastor Mark and I preached sermons about how important our kids are and our youth and all children are. And they're very vital and important, not just to the life of our church, but to the life of our world and our community. Not just because they're our future, but because they are now in the present an important part of our community and our world. And Jesus recognized this. Jesus cared about the children and interacted with them, gave time to children. And unfortunately, in our world and our culture, the children are usually the ones that we say, please go over here and just stay out of our hair. And if you're going to be loud, go in a quiet room where it's padded and just bounce around and be loud, but don't bother us. That happens in my house, and I'll admit, I do that all the time with my kids. That's because I'm with, well, I'm not with them 24-7, my wife is. But, you know, you just want to just, I want some peace and quiet, so just go. And we kind of act like that in our world. Our culture acts like that. The children are not as important. They're the lesser of the community, and so we just put them to the side. And many churches, not Bayside, but many churches say, yes, let's have your children's ministry or your youth ministry, but put it over there so we can focus on the important thing. And that's wrong. And I'm so thankful that this church supports and has a full-time youth pastor and supports youth ministry like we do and children's ministry like we do. And I see this all over this church. I'm so grateful for it. There's so many people that volunteer in our nursery and our children's programs and who give their time that care about children. So thank you to every one of you who do that. But today, I want to highlight just one family. Last Sunday, it just came upon me as I was listening. I listened to Mark's sermon and was thinking about what I was going to preach this week and these different ideas and thoughts were coming into my head about how we can be more like Jesus. And I walked around and I saw the children's church room. And Miss Adele was in there. Thank you, Miss Adele. God bless you. She teaches our children on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. And it's very important to me because that's two of my kids. But in there with Miss Adele are these three kids. Three youth. And every week that they're here at this church, they're helping out in the children's church. The Schottenbauer family, Noah, Molly, and Luke, these three kids who could be doing all these other things and could be going out having fun or sleeping in or whatever else, but they come every Sunday and they're Miss Adele's three little helpers. And I can't even remember how long they've been doing this. This is remember as long as I've remembered and seen my kids going into the children's church area. Noah and Molly and Luke care about the kids and they love them. And they interact with them. And it's not just in the class either. It's everywhere around the building. If you see these three Schottenbauer kids, you'll see them interacting with the kids. I saw it in Chicago when Noah went with us. And Noah was the one, if you remember, that got injured on the trip. Injured playing soccer with the kids. With the basketball, but still. He was, you know, trying to have fun. And these three kids, these three Schottenbauers, they go and, they, and they, they help every week, week in and week out because they care and they see the importance of ministering and loving and being there. Even though the, the kids that they're ministering to are just like And it's beautiful. It's a beautiful picture of the young people in our church wanting to be more like Jesus. If only all of us could be more like Jesus in this way. Thank you, Noah. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Luke. And also, thank you, Mom and Dad. Thank you, Mom and Dad, for allowing them to do that and for raising kids that care and want to be more like Jesus. Every time, seems like every time I just start crying. If you heard me preach long enough or from enough times, It happens quite often. I apologize. There's so many different ways 
that we can look to Jesus. And, and again, we might have to look beyond the big thing that happened. Look beyond the, the big miracle, which are, those things are important. But to see what we can do, to see the heart of Jesus and to follow that example and to be like Jesus by doing these things. And these, again, are just a few examples. I want to give you one more before we close. Something that all of us can do. Because you might have heard those three stories and heard those three examples and you might say, well, I, I can't do one of those. I hope that between those three, all of us in here could, could do one of those things. Either, you know, um, see the needs of somebody else and help take action to meet the needs. Uh, be willing to serve and to give for the benefit of others or for the benefit of the church. Or to love and to care for the children like Jesus did. But even if all of those seem like they're out of your league, there's one that we can all do that's very simple. It's found in Mark chapter 1, verse 35. And Jesus, rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. And there he prayed. You see, Jesus was pulled in a million different directions during his years of ministry. I can relate to that. Can you relate to that? Being pulled? If you have a family and you have kids, certainly you can relate to that. You know, maybe you're pulled in a lot of different directions at church, in your job, with your family, wherever you go. And when Jesus knew there was a time that he needed to just get away, he would go away and almost hide to a desolate place, it says, and pray. He got away from everything. He got away from everyone and just spent time in prayer, recharging, refueling, just spending time with the Father. Something that every single one of us can do is to pray. Get away from everything else. Get away from everyone else and pray. And sometimes you have to be intentional. We like to say, oh yeah, I, I, I can set up a time to pray. But a lot of the times, life, jobs, families, things get in the way. And so it breaks up. And then we find ourselves, oh man, and I do this all the time. I haven't spent any time in prayer today or the last couple days or the last week. How can we be spending that much time without spending time in prayer? And Jesus, I think, felt this too and would just get away. He'd have to get up early in the morning before anyone else was up. And if you have to do that, maybe, maybe that's what you have to do. And get away and find a quiet place and pray. So I encourage you to just think how you can do that. It's one of the easiest things that we can do to be more like Jesus. You know, Jesus came to this earth so that we could have life. He came to this earth with a specific purpose, for a specific reason, to save us of our sins, to save us from death, to give us life. But not only that, the story of salvation and the gospel, but Jesus not only wanted to have, to, for us to have life, but to have life to the full. And life to the full is when we're living like Jesus lived, abundantly, in the word, in prayer, and acting and living out just like Jesus did and being the hands and feet of Jesus, living out the purpose of God in our lives. And we can do that, but we can't let the world get in our way. Too often, we allow distractions to get in our way. And many of those distractions can be good things. Work, family, other things that go on in our lives. But too many times, we allow those distractions to get in our way and we don't live out the full abundant life that God has prepared and planned and wants for us if we would just be more like Jesus. John chapter 10, verse 10 Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And have it abundantly. 
And I believe an abundant life is a life with more Jesus. It's a life with more Jesus. And so here at Bayside, this year we're going to talk about Jesus. And so if you're tired of hearing about Jesus, you ought to go to a different church. And I don't mean that, I don't say that to be offensive. But we're going to talk about Jesus. And we're going to be more Jesus. And it starts with us. It starts with Mark and me and our staff and our leadership. But it goes to every single person in this congregation. If more of us are like Jesus, think of what can happen in this congregation and in this church. If more of us are like Jesus, think of what can happen in this community. If more of us are like Jesus, think of what could happen in this world. In three years, Jesus changed the world. He flipped it upside down. And 2,000 years later, we're still talking about it. What kind of impact can God have through us when we are more like Jesus? It's very simple. To be more like Jesus, we have to know the word and live the word. And so I encourage you today to just think about it. How can you see the needs? When you see the needs of people in this congregation or wherever you are in your life, how can you take action to meet those needs and have compassion on people like Jesus did? And when God asks you, are you willing? Are you ready to say, yes, Lord, I am willing? No matter what it is he's asking you to do, to serve and to give for the benefit of others. Or maybe you can be Jesus to our children, or to our youth, Maybe you just need to spend some time in prayer like Jesus did. Wherever you're at today, my encouragement to you is to be more like Jesus. In 2016, at Bayside, we want to be more like Jesus. More Jesus, less me. More Jesus. Let's pray.